Welcome to Coveraging Pro Webinar Series. Today's uh, webinar is part of our Get Prep or Get Rep Now series. By popular demand, we're bringing Get Rep Now back. And yeah. yay, it'll be back in September. Hi, what's going on, everybody? I'm Jim and uh, hi, Anna. How's everybody today? Hey. Cool. Um, so Get Rep Now is our uh, promotion that we do uh, from time to time, uh, which is basically, um, you know, send in your script for analysis. And if it's good, uh, we send it to our manager panel uh, and they guarantee to read it. And it's really that simple. So in other words, if, if you uh, send your script in for coverage and it scores a consider or better, which generally means uh, consider, uh, strong consider or recommend, which is generally like around the top 5% of submissions. So if it gets a, a consider or better for script, then that means you're in the zone. It's pretty close to being good to go. We send it to our manager panel and, and it will fingers. Be, yes, and we will be back with that in September. Yay. So Yay. let me properly introduce you to Jim and Anna. Hello, Anna, how are you? Hey, Tanya, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Jim, how are you? Uh, acceptable, thank you. Oh, that's good. So today we will be talking about the importance of the first 10 pages of your script and why they are so important. Now, so, that is the world's saddest birthday cake I just had. <laughs> so why are the first 10 pages so important? Duh. <laughs> Duh. Yeah, apart from all the obvious reasons? No, okay. Well, let's let's just go through the obvious reasons. I think it's important to state it since that is kind of the thesis of this whole thing. So first off the bat, it's your chance to make a great first impression, right? If they're not great, that's as far as anyone will get. This is just a real sad thing, but in the industry, a lot of people really don't read past the first 10 and it's kind of just an accepted thing you know for sometimes it's first 10 last five as as they say uh, it's actually true sadly true speaking of first impressions it can be quite disconcerting at times when you uh open a script and the first I don't know, two lines have five typos in them. Um, Anna, have you, uh, has something like that happened to you beforehand? Oh yeah, all the time. I mean, I think, I think there's a misunderstanding that people don't realize, a lot of writers don't realize exactly how many scripts readers read. I mean, you know, it's, it's not uncommon for a reader to go through 20, 25, 30 scripts in a week, you know, so they will start to blur together. And that's just, you know, production companies, agencies, contest readers, all that. They will start to blur together. So those first 10 pages, you know, if if it's a mess from the first page, you know, you're going to you're, you're going to make the reader angry to begin with. And it's just not going to be worth their time to keep going. Yeah, a lot of people don't even understand that that there isn't really time to read every script that comes in through most through most submissions that are coming in over the transom. You know, if, if it's like, it, let's let's say an agent or manager is covering a studio or something like that, then they will have to read every script that those studios are buying, for example. Right. Uh, but, you know, from beginning to end, you know, and then write up coverage on them and stuff like that. But if you're just, you know, if, if no one knows you, and let's say a, a producer or a manager or somebody says, send your script along, uh, it doesn't mean they're actually going to read the whole thing. More often than not, uh, they'll give you 10 pages, uh, and, and unless it's good, in which case they'll keep going. Exactly. And, 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 so, and mm -hmm. yeah, so, and by the way, so if they're not great, that's as far as anyone will get. But if they are great, that's as far as some people will read. And here's another really weird thing. There are people who are like successful agents in particular, but there are there are successful people in the industry who, as a point of pride, never read past the first 10 pages of a script. It's just like that's their thing, you know. So and and then you'll you'll find there, there are scripts that are sent around and get a lot of heat and stuff like that. And no one's actually read them. <laughs> But, yeah. they, but they've got a great first 10 pages. So you have to anticipate that as well. So, you know, they say, sure, you've got 120 pages or really 110 nowadays, but but really you've got 10. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, again, if something is really wrong in those first 10 pages, it's very difficult for a writer to dig themselves out. Because I know myself and I read a script and it starts off and you go, what is this? Even if it, you know, gets great afterwards, I don't know that I'm still on board. Because the importance also of the first 10 pages is the part where you build your world and you introduce your characters. And if we, the audience, or we, the reader, don't really, you know, don't get attached to your world or your characters, you know, you got to get us on board in those first 10 pages. And as it says here, the goodwill that you earn through the first 10 can carry you a long way. So the converse of what you were just talking about there, Tanya, is, you know, if you do do a good or even adequate job, uh, then people kind of go, OK, I, I kind of like what you're doing here. I'll, I'll, I'll bear with you. And maybe there's some rough patches in your act one or things where, you know, maybe your pacing is a little slow or something. Maybe it's just not perfect. But, you know, if you've scored some goodwill, in that first 10, then people will be more than willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. Uh, in other words, clean presentation, uh, you know, intriguing characters, you understand structure, you understand your pre your format, then, you know, people will be like, eh, OK, I'll roll the dice. I'll keep reading. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, also keep in mind that um, it's like the foundation of a house, as we say here, and as I, I think I keep saying in my coverage reports as well. This, if your foundation is not solid, your house, in other words, your script, is not going to stand. So often you have things like, oh, gee, that's the inciting incident. It happens on page two. So then you know there's something wrong. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. Anna, I want to ask you about this one. Uh, um, sure. If you create... A negative impression, digging yourself out of that hole is tough, even if someone has to read the whole script. Now, you've yeah. read for a lot of coverage companies and a lot of contests. Right. And so there's lots of times when you do have to read a whole script. In fact, probably most of the time, uh, we don't really have the luxury here at Coverage Inc. of reading <laughs> the first 10 pages. Um, so, but I want to just talk about the negative mindset. Like if someone does create a negative first impression, is it possible to get over that or does it sort of taint the whole read? Um, I think it does. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, you know, the places I work for, you have to read everything. So it means you're constantly reading. But um, I do think it makes a negative impression and it, it is very hard to get out of that. I ha I've certainly read plenty of scripts where the second half of the script was stronger than the first half. I mean, that, that does happen all the time. Hmm. But, you know, if you're grumpy, <laughs> Because it starts out really slow. And, and, and I know we're going to get into examples of what, you know, not so great beginnings are. Um, it's hard to sort of recoup that because you just kind of want to start skipping because you're like, oh, my God, I hope this is going to get better. Um, yeah. And, that, you, and that's why we force all of our readers to write a synopsis and go back and read a script a second right. time. Just yeah, in it's, case. It's very difficult. That, that mindset has kicked in. And also, you know, I mean, I, mean, I know we're, we're, we're talking about I think we're talking primarily about features, but in TV, it's even worse because in television, you probably get five minutes, I would say, in a pilot because 10 minutes of a 60 page script or a 30 page script, you know, is is an eon. Like there's there's so much more territory you have to cover in a True. much shorter period of time. So I would say in a pilot, you get like the first five. Yeah. Oh, OK. So it's not not the first act. Um, no, I mean, by the T, honestly, by the end of this, if you've got a teaser or a cold open, by the end of that, if you haven't like really sort of sunk some claws in, it's gonna kind of, it still kind of feels like it's gonna be downhill from there. Like a really fantastic opening of a show is really gonna grab someone, but it just, you know, if it's a 30 minute show and you've only got, you've only got 30 pages to make, to tell the whole story, like I wanna know what's going on by like page six. <laughs> you know, True. like beyond that, it's like all of a sudden you're like 15 pages in, you're halfway through. You know, that's one of the most common notes that we give on TV pilots is, yeah. uh, you know, actually, actually get to the premise of the show. It can't just mm -hmm. all be set up. Yeah. Um, all, all right. We're going to go on to a few great openings. But before we uh, get into details, I just want to check something. All right. Uh, Guys, if you look at this opening, because it comes back to the thing that we so often say, if you're already in the club, certain rules don't apply to you than if you're not in the club. Um, so looking at this opening, 
what do you guys, and feel free to uh, use the question box, what do you think you should not do because you are not in the club yet? So feel free to uh, use the question box. And All right, so, so let's read these because, you know, people might not be able to see the screen and no one's going to read all this text. So, um, hint, uh, hint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Macro shot like an abstract painting, only one area in focus. It's an actor's character box. We slowly pan to see a monocle, different pairs of eyeglasses, rubber appliances, various makeups, a collection of dental applications, an assortment of brushes. A hand comes into frame and removes a small bottle. We follow it to see it is spirit gum. The other hand enters frame and uncaps the bottle. Follow one hand as it applies the spirit gum to a cheek. We see only a portion of the cheek. Now the hands apply spirit gum to a rubber scar. Again, we follow the hands as they place the scar upon the actor's cheek. The ritual continues as we watch a mustache being applied. The hands then search out the dental appliances and pick one. We study the movement as appliances as the appliance is inserted into the actor's mouth. Throughout the above, we hear someone mumbling, but we cannot make out the words. Suddenly we hear, next! <laughs> Excellent. Um, and that, of course, is from Tootsie. Tootsie. And thank you, guys, because, yes, you are all absolutely right. You said the action description shouldn't be so long and detailed, uh, too much text, too much description, block of text. Exactly. Thank you, guys. You guys rock. You got it. <laughs> okay. But I yeah. did put this under the great openings. Why did I put this under great? Now, of course, Remember, this was written 30 some odd years ago by yeah. Larry, Larry Gelbart, the great creator of MASH, who can do anything that he wants. And once again, as we've stressed in these webinars before, different sets of rules for people who are, you know, established and in the industry and in creators and are, you know, established creators versus you and I, uh, people who are emerging writers trying to break in. People just have much less patience for this sort of style of writing anymore as well. Um, but but why this is in here is, first of all, it's an extremely visual opening, okay? It's images. We're starting with lots of images. And in fact, Tootsie is just a brilliant script, top to bottom, great movie. But, um, you know, the, and we'll, we'll actually get back to Tootsie in just a moment as, as well. There's another excerpt that's in here from there. Uh, but, but one thing that Tootsie does very well is it, it paints an impression of this character and who he is in the first 10 pages uh, with some great dialogue, but mostly visually. Right, and yep. also, you know, if you were to write this today, you could write the same scene using a lot of these same visuals and it could be much cleaner with just a few a few ad adjustments, you know? Yeah. It's not, it's not so, so far off of what you would see today. It's just a little, you know, the older style is a little clunkier. It's a little more condensed. If you look at like the, the opening of Raiders of the Lost Ark, it's pages and pages and pages of description. Mm -hmm. And you just, you'd never see that now. Yeah. So. Yeah, slug lines are your friend nowadays. Oh, yes. yeah. And, and we have an example, <laughs> I think, it, coming up next, or two examples down the road, which is heavy with slug lines. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here's, a, here's another one we should read. Um, so, Tanya, can you do Jane? And uh, Anna, can you do... Ricky and Lester, and I'll do the narration. All right, go for it. Okay, interior Fitz house, Ricky's bedroom night. On video, Jane Burnham lays in bed wearing a tank top. She's 16 with dark, intense eyes. I need a father who's a role model, not some horny geek boy who's going to spray his shorts whenever I bring a girlfriend home from school. What a lame -o. Somebody really should put him out of his misery. Her mind wanders for a beat. Want me to kill him for you? Jane looks at us and sits up. Yeah, would you? Fade to black. Fade in. Exterior Robin Hood Trail. Early morning. We're flying above suburban America, descending slowly towards a tree-lined house. My name is Lester Berman. This is my neighborhood. This is my street. This is my life. I'm 42 years old. In less than a year, I'll be dead. Yeah, okay. So we all obviously that's all from American Beauty. So why is this? A good opening. Why do Why do you think I selected this particular one as a good opening? I mean, you could you could argue that the whole first bit with Jane and Ricky, you know, it's not really a grabber. I mean, it's 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 interesting. It certainly sets up their characterizations and what's going on. But but what's so great about this first page of American Beauty? Yeah, guys, feel free to use the question box if you have any ideas or input. 
why do you think what do you think works here so while we're waiting for people to chime in i'll just answer the question <laughs> yes uh, well we already have perfect perfect answer oh, yeah. set up the mystery about how he's going to die yes. or in fact that he is going to die yeah. yes so we we pose a really fascinating dramatic question that now hooks us like oh okay that's interesting how is this going to happen it's an unusual way of starting a story and it makes us want to find out the answer to the question to unravel the mystery uh we're gonna have an excerpt from breaking bad in a little bit as well which the beginning of that poses the exact same question what the hell is going on i want to find out more about this so if you pose a question at the very beginning of the script and it's a it's a really intriguing question and you answer it during the course of the story people will again that will buy you some goodwill and people will be right. on also, board also you know talking about american beauty for a second you know what's great about that first page is that it tells you an enormous enormous amount about you know the guy that will be the protagonist before we even meet him and and that's yes uh, very good and also very difficult to do. So if you can do it effectively and quickly, that's fantastic. All right. This next example is from a movie that you might not expect us to, to be on this list because, frankly, it sucks. And that's Alien 3. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, what a botched job that thing was. But the reason that this thing is on here is because this first page of this particular draft of Alien 3, which I don't think is the shooting draft, but this is a hell of an example of really tight visual writing, uh, writing down the page, using slug lines. Um, it's, it's just really, it's really great. Um, now, I happen to know the screenwriter of this. The, this was written, this draft was written by John Fasano and Vincent Ward. Uh, John Fasano uh, was my ex-brother-in-law, and he unfortunately passed away, but he was telling me the story about the production of this, and, and basically none of the writers who worked on this project actually wanted to write the movie that we all saw. It, it, it was just, it was handed down to them. They had no choice. Believe me, no one wanted to kill Newt. Uh, it, it, that's just the way it was. It's what they had to work with as a writer on assignment. You guys might all find yourselves in situations like that where you've got to kind of make, you know, Shinola out of shit. But let's just read it real quick. The screen is black. A pinpoint of light appears. Red and ember. Unseen bellows blow. Glass furnace. The embers glow. Flame. The fire grows. A river of molten glass. Heated by the furnace to over 1300 degrees Fahrenheit white hot all right i'm not going to read the rest but you guys get the idea um lots of images you know really fast just single word descriptions of things it pulls you in quickly and you'll see each little fragment um you know it's, it's a little fragment then we move down the page that's called writing down the page uh we don't necessarily use the whole the whole sentence space the whole line space we just put a single line and then we hit that uh, carriage return and we move on to the next one. It keeps your eye moving down the page faster. It's a, it's a great technique. Yes, and again, slug lines are your friend. All right, here, we, let's get to what should you have in your first 10 pages. Uh, and here is the first very important point, the protagonist in his, her known world. and. If I could point to one thing that so often, so, so, so often goes wrong is that simply put, people don't use a setup. Um, oh, actually, hold on. We have a very important question that we absolutely need to answer. The question was, what is a slug line? So a slug line is, for instance, here, glass furnace glass factory, smoke, a man. So basically it's a line capitalized that draws our eye that is the heading of what we're seeing. And so, go ahead. Yeah, so so uh, yeah, exactly. And and particularly they tend to be visuals. I mean they, they it, it's not they're not really for sounds. Um they are they sort of fill in they sort of do the work of instead of writing, you know, we see or, you know, the camera does this. Instead, you just, you put it on its own line in all caps. And it's a way of telling, it's a way of telling the director what to shoot and what to focus on without actually telling the director 
what to do because that's actually a no-no and, and people hate that. So it's a technique that's been developed where um, it just it's it's calling the shots, literally the calling you know what the camera is looking at at any given moment in time without camera direction. And yeah, also again, as you will see, they nicely break up those blocks of text and make it a lot easier and user friendly. Yeah, exactly. So feel free to use them in your writing. Please do. Key images, especially if they're important things that you want people to look at, don't write we see or the camera goes in close on his hand. We don't need any of that. Just write his hand as a slug line and then tell us exactly what we're looking at on the hand. Like we see the, the scar where, uh, you know, where, where, where the ring used to be or, you know, you know, whatever. Okay. So, all right, back to the setup, because again, this is like one of the things that so, so, so many writers get wrong. And it's the most important thing of your, uh, the most important part of your script. It is your setup. What is your protagonist like? What is your world like? We need to know this before the story proper starts. So let, yeah, so let's clearly define what we mean by setup in this particular instance, okay? Now, setup specifically means um, we are showing who this movie is about. Your protagonist or protagonists, that's what should be in your first 10. Not story, necessarily. If the story is starting too early and we don't know who the movie is about, we're not going to care. And this is a really common mistake. What's called the inciting incident, which is usually the thing that sets the plot in motion, you know, the kind of the monkey wrench that that comes into the main character's life and changes things and forces that character to take on the mission of the story. If that happens in the first 10 pages, you are shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, more often than not, you can't really get away with that. And, and we see this all the time in scripts that come in where the inciting incident is on page one or page two. And we don't know who this movie is about. So how are we supposed to care that this inciting incident has just hit and affected so-and-so's life? Exactly. So what we're doing also in the first 10 is we're establishing the protagonist's, you know, Achilles heel, his dramatic need or his flaw, the thing that the protagonist will in the course of the story overcome. In other words, it's the beginning of the protagonist's character arc. So Anna, talk a little bit about theme. Um, you know, we have state your theme right. here on, on, the, on um, this list. So how do you, how, first of all, what is theme? And second of all, how do you do that? How do you state your theme? Uh, theme is uh, theme is difficult. <laughs> theme <laughs> is one of those things where uh, it's sort of, it's character and uh, kind of like the core of your connection to the audience all sort of rolled in one. So, you know, whatever your story is really about at heart is is what the story's theme is. And often that tends to be what it is that the your main character needs to learn. I mean, if your character starts off knowing everything and not having a problem to solve and not have some kind of internal mess to get through, um, then they have nowhere to go. And so the audience has nowhere to go. I mean, we go to movies and we go to we watch TV because we want to kind of go on a journey with these characters. And so part of that journey is going to be uh, established through the story's theme. So like, uh, what are some big ones? Um, there's no place like home. Yes, there's no place like home. That's the big one. The Wizard, the Wizard of Oz is actually, if you ever want a great, if you need like a refresher on structure, theme, character, everything, go watch The Wizard of Oz. It's like possibly the most perfect like screenwritery kind of movie ever, even though it's it's completely like, it's very, very basic. But, the you know, Dorothy gets trapped in Oz. What does she want? She wants to go home. She needs to learn that she shouldn't have left in the first place. That's what the journey is about. It's very, very, very simple, which is great. Um, this is something now, right what's interesting, though, is that it it's kind of starts as uh, the, the theme's a little deceptive because first we think that the theme is the grass is always greener mm -hmm. on, on the other side, but then it's replaced with, you know, it's sort of discarded and revealed at the end. No, the theme is actually, no, there's no place like home. Like, appreciate right. what you've got, you know? And I mean, also, too, I mean, you can look at theme as kind of more of a general thing. It's it's the subject that all the different characters are going to deal with in their own way. I mean, if the Wizard of Oz is all about what it means to be home, about finding your identity, you know, that applies to all the different characters in the movie as well. Um, and almost every sort of big 
basic, you know, A to B kind of mainstream movies going to have that. I mean, I think art house movies, anything that's a little alternative or independent is, um, is it might be a little more difficult to nail it down, but like um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind is one of my favorite movies. And that's a great movie about relationships, but it's also about how, you know, the the repetition and the struggle of of like going the, you go through the pain of relationships because that's what you do and accept learning to accept that that's really what the movie's about so so they don't necessarily have to be totally on the nose they can be they can mm-hmm. be complicated they can be you know sort of fractured in different ways but it really helps if your story has some kind of a core uh, emotional idea at its heart that's going to help you kind of craft everything else around it. I like to think of it as like an emotional skeleton that you're going to build everything else on top of. And when it says state your theme, mythologically speaking, um, you know, according to myth, there is a messenger who arrives, you know, generally around like, you know, five minutes into the story who literally will tell you what the theme of the story is. Now, obviously, there's many ways to get your theme out. Oftentimes it's, uh, you know, it's stated by the main character. Oftentimes it's stated by someone who is not the main character, who is observing uh, you know, traits of the main character or wishes the main character could be a certain way. There's different ways to get it out there. Um, Mm -hmm. But when it says state your theme, it is in fact literally stating your theme. You can kind of hide it a little bit as long as it comes through, but um, uh, all right, let's let's keep it moving. So tight Tight visual writing. writing. Yes, well, we already spoke about that. That's where our slug lines again come in. Slug lines are your friend. So you you do want to write down the page and you do want to make sure it's visual. You're not writing a play, you're writing a movie script. So whatever you put on, if it's not on the page, it's not on the screen and you want to make sure that it is a visual script. And by the way, there's other ways to do that. Doesn't necessarily have to be slug lines, um, you know, but it still should be visual. Right. Um, one, one thing that's not on this list that I would add to establish the protagonist's dramatic need or flaw is to, you know, tell, tell us why we care about this person. Uh, we don't have to like them. And I think, I think there's a lot of, um, there's some misunderstanding about that because, you know, you don't have to necessarily like a protagonist. They can be an anti-hero. They can be a terrible person. But we have to know why we're, why we are rooting for them to succeed no matter how messed up their journey is going to be. And that really needs to be in the first few minutes. Yeah. Because otherwise, why am I going to devote two hours of my life to following this character's journey? So, okay, that that's an interesting question. So, you know, generally, like, they, you know, the rule of thumb is a character doesn't need to be likable. A character needs to be fascinating. Yes. But, but you're right. But we still need to kind of, we, we do need a reason to keep following this person. Um, I, I, you know, I, I personally like to look at it like, you know, if in the first 10 pages, if we do our setup properly, as Tanya said, and we show, uh, you know, the ins and outs of this character and this character's life before the story hits, hopefully I'm intrigued enough by what's going on that even if I don't necessarily like the character, I'll kind of want to see where it goes just because the character is, you know, so so fascinating. I mean, the character could even be repellent, like, you know, as good as it gets. Uh, and then it's like, oh my God, what a train wreck. Where's this going to go? Yeah. Okay. Going back to posing a question to be answered later. Let's go back to our Wizard of Oz. Is the grass really always greener on the other side, for yeah. example? A- True that. Yep. Well, a- what's cle- happened to Lester? Yeah. <laughs> Right. A clever opening. So what do we mean by clever opening? Okay, so, um, you know, look, there's a lot of different ways you can start a screenplay. But um, one thing that people do like to do is what's called the hook. And the hook is a scene. It could be like a pre credit sequence. It could be, you know, just emblematic of what your main character does. In other words, let's say your main character is a hostage negotiator. So we see that character doing what he or she does best as a hostage negotiator in, uh, you know, a heightened crisis type situation that where we very quickly and visually get a handle on what this character does. Uh, It throws us right into the deep end of the pool. uh, And because it's, 
you know, because it's intense and we get, you know, and, and it's so visual and we get an idea of everything that's going on, uh, it hooks us. We're like, oh, that's interesting. It's not necessarily, you know, um, it, it's not necessarily anything to do with the story necessarily. But what it is, is it's a flashy, grabby visual opening that does tell us about character. Right. It's, it's also a good way to save some pages. Um, be, just because, you know, you're getting to the meat of like, who is this guy? What does he do? Or her, you know, very, very quickly while also getting things moving. Absolutely. And actually that ties in with one of the following points, which is show, don't tell. Um, and you probably have heard this one a lot, show, don't tell. In other words, let us, the audience, see what this person is like. Don't tell us what this person is like. In other words, don't have someone go to the protagonist. You protagonist, you are such and such person. And I hate it when you do such and such. And I like it when you do such and such, but that's because your psychology is such and such. Yeah, don't do that. Show us, <laughs> show, don't tell. It's one so of the hardest things yeah. for writers to do. And even, you know, I even struggle with this in my writing and I've been doing, you know, I've been a writer for 30 some odd years. Um, you know, look, Chekhov said it best right there. You know, don't tell me the moon is shining. Show me the glint of light on broken glass. And what an, what an amazing visual that is. But, you know, we instantly interpret that in our mind and we know what it is we're looking at. It, it's, it's great. But when I sit down to write, my thought process doesn't work that way. The first thing I always think is the moon is shining. And then I start, then I write that down and I've got to sit and I've got to really think about like, is that the best way to depict that? And hopefully sometimes I'll catch it and I'll go back and I'll actually be able to write something as eloquent as, you know, the glint of light on broken glass, but most of the time, probably not. And that also ties in nicely with exhibiting your voice and what is your voice? What makes you stand out because you're not like any other writer and neither should you try to be like any other writer you know be yourself it's a tough act to follow but so where you exhibit your voice is also part of that is in your narrative how do you tell people what it is that they're seeing right now um so yeah make sure you don't you know try to be anyone that you're not be yourself now, look, I mean, it's like if he, this might be you might look at that and go, well, how could I not exhibit my voice? I'm writing the script. Duh. It's, it seems like pretty obvious. But but actually think about it. You know, you're a writer. You're basically you're you're peddling a commodity. The, the commodity is both the screenplay or, or the pilot that you're writing as well as yourself. You know, it, it is it is a sample. Most of the time when you're sending out a piece of material, it's not necessarily for consideration to buy. I mean, we all hope that that's going to be the case. But the reality is usually it's just to for people to get a, a taste of what you can do. So your first 10 pages is the place where you can show them that. So what is it that you do best? Are you are you really facile with um, with dialogue or, or you know, snappy uh, snappy, witty dialogue. Is that, is that your strength? Well, bring it, bring it as soon as possible. Get that right on page one. We've got a great example from Iron Man coming up where you can see on page one, boom, we know these writers have a hell of, you know, have some amazing dialogue chops. Uh, are you great with action writing? Um, whatever it is, get it, get it in there and, and show off a little bit. Don't be afraid to show off, which doesn't mean overwriting. Exactly. Um, well, we've already spoken about lots of white space, so have lots of white space and write down the page because you don't want to read it to open your script and they see just, you know, ink, 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 and their eyes will glaze over right away. You don't want that reaction. Uh, so, Anna, and let's let's say Larry Gelbart's draft of Tootsie that we just looked at page one of came across your desk and you had to read it for coverage. So. I'm going to imagine that your first impression would be, oh, God, this dense block of text <laughs> I have to get through. But you'd read it and then you'd eventually go, oh, this is actually quite good. The writer's style just needs some work. Yeah. Right. But but that negative first impression would would hit like a brick. Right. I think I think constantly. I mean, I'm an I'm I'm a hugely harsh reader. I mean, I, I can't help it. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, you, I'd be constantly waiting for that clunkiness to come back. Because to me, that's what it looks like. Like, yes, it's a great collection of imagery, but but it's just, it's slow. Like I look at it in that and I think that's a minute and a half of, of visuals condensed down into a paragraph of, of 
really dense writing, you know, and if it's my, let's say fourth or fifth script of the day, uh, yeah, I might just skim it. <laughs> no, just, yeah. It's the nature of it. You like your, you, you know, like your brain just can't, can only handle so much visual imagery without spacing it out. If it were spaced out into a nice clean series of shots, I'd be much more likely to go, oh, this is kind of cool. All right, remember yeah. that, people. Please remember that. Okay, so write, write, get it on the page. Write what you want to write by all means, but remember, you know, how you present it is important. I'm gonna get a lot of requests now that say, please don't give this to Anna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so strong sense of pace. Yes, and um, a lot of writers also seem to struggle with that because, you know, we are used to, uh, in life, uh, act a certain way. Like, in life, there is lots of small talk. Hi, how are you? Long time no see. What's up? What's new? What's happening? So that's that's real life. Uh, so, But don't put that on the page. So here, here's a great example. Um, Tanya, can you read Chuck? And Anna, can you read Theo? So here's a bad here's a bad example. Here's what not to do. Okay. Theo enters the office, closes the door. Chuck Asparagus, 35, three-piece suit straight from the Goodwill store, extends a hand. Thanks for coming in, Theo. Always a pleasure, Chuck. How's the lumbago? Not bad, except on humid days and days that end in the letter Y. Good one, Chuck. Theo, looking over the Q4 reports, we have a problem. Now, here's a different version of that exact same scene. Theo sits at the desk of Chuck Asparagus, 35, three-piece suit straight from the Goodwill store. Theo, looking over the Q4 reports, we have a problem. Now, I'm going to guess that most people <laughs> really don't care about, you know, Chuck's lumbago. Uh, just now, if Chuck is a, is, is a major character and you want to sort of paint him three dimensionally by giving him a health condition, that's perfectly fine. But right now, this seems like expendable small talk. And it's perfectly fine to write all this stuff, but then go back and edit it out. You know, it's great. Write, write your vomit draft, as they call it, you know, which is 160 pages long. And then go back and then just look for the stuff you can cut. You want that first 10 to be tight, tight, tight. Keep it moving, folks. Absolutely. Paint your protagonist as a fully developed and flawed person, not a Mary Sue. Jim, you want to explain the term Mary Sue? Oh, I would love to. Okay. <laughs> The Mary Sue is a trope. Uh, it started in 1973 when a fan fiction writer sent in a story into a Star Trek fanzine in which she wrote uh, about an ensign on board the Starship Enterprise who was 15 years old, rather like the writer was at the time, who was great at everything. She was beautiful. She was a master of Kung Fu. Uh, she, was a, she was a genius. Half the Kirk was in love with her. Captain Kirk leaves Yeoman Rand and professes his love to her. And it's all completely unearned. Uh, it, it, so basically, the Mary Sue has come to mean any character in popular fiction that um, is written by generally an amateur writer who doesn't know what they're doing, who has created kind of like a, a Superman or woman type character where they have not deserved or th that that status is not deserved. In other words, we don't see the long training sequence where this person learns their Kung Fu, uh, uh, you know, or where they've met, learned to master, you know, applied sciences or anything like that. We're just simply supposed to accept all of that. And now in a comedy, that's great. Like Black Dynamite is a great example. Black Dynamite is a Mary Sue. And that's why Black Dynamite is so freaking hilarious um but if you're doing this for real it's bad and it is a screenwriting cliche we see it all the time and sad to say ironically enough that star trek discovery is probably the best example i can give you of a mary sue in contemporary entertainment because michael burnham is a mary sue and which gives you an idea of the writing talent of the people behind that show it's also become a, a sort of a, a catch-all phrase for uh, underdeveloped female characters too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. True. Oh, quick side question. Uh, we have a question. Didn't that character, the Mary Sue character, uh, become Wesley Crusher in TNG? Jim, you're the expert on Star Trek. Anything? Um, 
you could argue that Wesley Crusher has elements of the Mary Sue. Yes, I would say probably not fully. I, I'd give Wesley Crusher like a 75 percent on the Mary on the Mary Sue scale. Uh, first of all, the stories did not revolve around the Mary Sue. According to the Mary, the Mary Sue trope, the character has to be incredibly important to the universe. Like, you know, the world will stop if this character you know, did not exist. Uh, things just unnaturally happen to this character, like aliens just show up seeking this character out of nowhere, Th things like that. That generally didn't happen to Wesley Crusher. He was really in the background for most episodes, and there was only a handful of episodes that focused on him. But yeah, there were a few where he was just, you know, magic boy who pulled solutions out of his ass, and he was, you know, such a genius. But you could also argue that, hey, we also... So years of him training behind the helm of a starship. He was an ensign. That's what he was doing there. So, yeah, so I'd give him 75%. And we are going back to Tootsie. All right. So here's another excerpt from Tootsie, which um, I wanted to put in just because it's got that great montage. And, uh, you know, Tim Albaugh from UCLA always talks about the Tootsie montage. And and uh, I, I, I think it's it's a great example of showing us who your protagonist is uh, visually and in a very small amount of page space. We really get a complete idea uh, of this guy just through this wonderful little montage at the beginning of the movie. So if you're, if you're wondering, how can I possibly show the world all the ins and outs of my character and paint this person dimensionally in a page or two, just go back and rewatch Tootsie. Or better yet, let's take a look at, at a little bit of this montage. Now, by the way, this is a cut down. The montage went on for three pages, you know, about three three minutes of screen time. Um, but boy, do we learn who this guy is by the end of that montage. You know, four minutes into the movie, we know everything there is to know that, about this guy. Okay. Close scrapbook pages. Main titles begin. The early years. A six-year-old Michael in a school play. My first play scrawled beneath the picture, a high school newspaper article about Michael Dorsey in another costume, older now, a high school play next. So, you know, we've got the callback motif of the character keeps saying next over it all. So we know he's facing rejection after rejection. Moving forward, as you can see, we went from scene five to scene 11. Please don't number your scenes in the screenplay. This is for shooting scripts only. Uh, scrapbook. Music and title. So they're using the old scrapbook technique. We're looking at the scrapbook. We've seen this technique used a lot in movies, television shows, etc. You know, the old pan over the um, the pictures on the wall, for example, or the newspaper clippings, uh, you know, the bulletin board in the office that's got all the important information on it or, you know, information about the character. And it, it, very visually, that is a way of telling you backstory both about your protagonist and the world okay? absolutely and if you in fact a plus points if you can find a way to do that that's not for instance as you know used as often as for example newspaper clippings because yeah. that's kind of one of those little cliches yeah Sure, it's a cliche, but it yeah. works. I mean, look look at Children of Men, okay? Children of Men has an extremely complex world that is set up in, in the, plus the protagonist. Basically, we're setting up not just the protagonist, but we're setting up the world all in the first 10 minutes of that screenplay. Well, how, so how do they do that? Well, they use every technique known to man, uh, basically, in order to tell you all this stuff as quickly as possible from showing you scenes of everyday life in the outside world, uh, billboards, you know, the old pan over the bulletin board trick. Um, you know, we have a terrorist event, you know, we scenes on, on the bus where, with, or, you know, where, where we see the, you know, the people in the, in the world and the community. And it's all, all a very fast and visual way of showing us exactly what is going on in the society. Yeah. I mean, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Anna. No, go ahead, go ahead. That's a great screenwriter's movie, too. I think, you know, every, I think everybody, every writer should watch that movie. I mean, it's just, it's so well crafted. It's so full of nuance. Um, it's a great, it's also a great script, but it's a great movie. So. Well, for that world building, I think in, in particular, yeah, it is a great movie, but, but also like, you know, we see a lot of scripts that, that come in where, you know, they're set in alternate universes, sci-fi worlds, whatever. And, you know, it's not just setting up the character. It is, how do you, how do you tell us what's going on? in this world? How do you set up the rules of the world? How do you show us the world that this story is taking place in so completely that we don't need to keep explaining things? Or characters don't have to say, 
well, Bill, you know, this is how things are here in, you know, 22nd century America. Um, you, 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 children of men, great example for, for yeah, how to I do mean, all that. Absolutely. I mean, basically, also what you do is you establish not only your world and your characters and your backstory, if needs be, but also your tone. A good example of, of that is the pilot of Falling Skies, which uh, sadly, sadly underrated show. Um, but in the pilot of Falling Skies, there is a lot of uh, basically we, we go in and it's after the alien invasion. The aliens have taken over. There's only a band of tiny, tiny, you know, a few, few, few humans left that are fighting back. So we need to know all of this. Otherwise, we don't know what's going on. And the way they do it is uh, by children's drawing. So there's a child and the kid is in therapy uh, because of what, you know, his mother has been killed by the aliens and his, his dad and his brothers are out there, you know, trying to get food for everyone. And so they do that via the child and the kid's drawings. And it's it, it attaches us. Not only does it give us the info that we need to get on board with the story, but it also uh, attaches us to those characters because there is a child clearly in pain. So that creates sympathy. And also it gives us the tone of the world. It is very, very bleak where you have children who, you know, need to grow up way before their time. So all of that works very well and tells us what we need to know in a visual way. Yeah, so this goes right back to show, don't tell. These are all techniques that the writers of these things have used so that we do not have to have expository dialogue. If you've got expository dialogue in your first 10 pages, stop and think, how can I get this information out in a visual way? Find a way to do it. Right, let's go to what to avoid in the first 10 pages. We already talked about the inciting incident. Please don't let it happen on page three. Just don't. You need that. You need those pages to set up your characters and your world. So the inciting incident, you know, page 12 would be great. Yeah, we, we're not going to care about your character if we don't know who they are. Use the first 10 pages to show us the ins and out of that character, who we are watching the movie about. Yeah, avoid camera direction at all cost. There is a close-up of this person. The camera pans, you know, up to his nose, and then we will have a wide shot of the landscape, yet none of that. Yeah, again, if you're Larry Gelbart, you know, you, you can do that. If, if you're a, an established creator, you can pretty much do whatever you want. But people reading spec scripts and pe spec pilots, they don't want to see that. And, and frankly, it's considered insulting to uh, directors on the project. Directors hate that. Yes. Uh, titles or credits. Yeah, you don't need them. That's not, you know, it's not part of the script. It's not part of the story. Well, yeah. And, and also, again, it goes back to, you know, perceptions uh, like the director's perceptions. You know, the directors do not want to be told if they should even have titles or credits at all, uh, much less where to put them. Now, you can you can put something in a script that clearly would be a great place where if there's going to be a title sequence, it should probably be on the montage that you put, uh, you know, from page two to four, uh, like in Tootsie, you know, had Larry Gelbart not put, you know, titles begin, which he did, uh, had he not put that and the director was actually looking through that and thinking, Hmm, this would be a good place for a title sequence. That's the director's prerogative. But we as writers of spec scripts cannot tell the director what to do it's considered bad form and that's the type of thing that people judge you on because you're expected to know this stuff don't tell the director what to do and no song calls so don't say okay the who's pure and easy is playing yet yeah, don't don't do that <laughs> Yeah, so, song licensing is expensive. And again, your song choices might not be the same as the director's. So, you know, if your script is heading towards production uh, and, you know, you haven't been fired, <laughs> you, you, can, you can go to the director, hopefully, and say, hey, you know, I've always had in mind uh, the who's pure and easy for this segment. And the director will say, uh, thank you. I'll keep that under advisement and then completely <laughs> ignore you. <laughs> Uh, long scenes. So you, again, you don't want scenes that go on for five or 10 pages. And believe it or not, that happens. Um, I mean, it should only happen in plays, not in screenplays. However, at times, um, writers have a hard time editing themselves. But yes, do keep yeah. your scenes to three pages or under. Yeah, I, right, I mean, right. 
Write those in the vomit draft and then please edit yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I think people don't really like it's next time you, you find yourself in that position, go watch, go watch a movie that has, and, and just time some of the scenes, like people, the, the perception of how long it takes for things to happen on paper versus on, on screen is completely different. And I mean, five minutes of screen time is an eon. Yeah. Oh yeah. Especially not in the first 10, please, you know, please. I mean, you know, look, there's, there's plenty of great movies that have long scenes in them. And if you, if you've built up that goodwill through the course of the story to finally get to a moment where you've got this really long, great, uh, you know, interrogation scene or, or something like that. Great. You know, that, that's fine. But um, yeah, you, you, first impressions are so important. Keep it moving, please. Right. I mean, it's not like if you're Robert Altman and it's, and you're watching the first, what is it? The eight minute tracking shot at the beginning of um, Gosfoot <laughs> Park. Yeah. Yeah. So, but then again, we're not Robert Altman, so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, we've already spoken about overriding and non-visual writing, and there's a great example. So this little example is great of what overriding looks like. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's, let's uh, come to one of my pet peeves, the protagonist beginning their day. And the oh, reason God. why that is a pet peeve is because oh, it happens so, so, so often. Your protagonist, I mean, like how many scripts, how many movies have you seen with the protagonist um, gets up in the morning, the protagonist brushes his or her teeth so, so, so many times. Just if you can come up with anything else, really, that would be great. I mean, there are exceptions. There, the exceptions are when you manage to do something that's completely subversive with that. Uh, yes. The one that I, I always come back to is uh, Stranger Than Fiction, which has to start with him getting up and going around his, about his day because it establishes, you know, sort of this rigid structure that this character has been living yeah. and completely turns it on end. But Absolutely. It's, it's yeah, another... Do. Another good example is what we do in the shadows. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the protagonist wakes up and uh, turns off the alarm clock, but the protagonist is in a coffin. He's a vampire. So, right. you know, right. so, so those are, of course, exceptions. But yeah, don't do the, oh, my person just, you know, does, goes through their routine. We yeah, will not care. Work, we don't care. Like, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> and so car carry that forward. What you're basically saying is if you're using any trope, do not use that trope unless you're aware that you're using the trope and put a new spin on it. Like mm -hmm. I am using this specifically because it is a trope and I want to subvert people's expectations. I'm going to use the trope, but then it's going to become this. And if you do that, people will love you. So right. that's, ex that's exactly what we look for as a hallmark of, of good screenwriting. So one of the reasons I love Kung Fu Panda three so much uh, because that movie is so snarky, it subverts the expectations of the hero's journey throughout with, you know, the character of Poe, the panda, commenting, uh, you know, on sort of a, 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 a meta level as to, you know, what should what he's doing and what should be what should be happening versus what's actually happening in the movie throughout the process. It's, it's really fun. If you've never seen it, do check it out. Writing things we cannot see or know in scene description. So what we mean by that is <clears throat> quite often uh, a writer will give uh, will give you the character's entire background in uh, in the action description. For example, this is Dr. Joe Schmo. He's had a hard time in medical school, but he finally managed to graduate from medical school, and now he is an attending. He doesn't like it all that much, <laughs> but you know his wife needs the money, so he keeps you know fixing up people because his wife is such a spendthrift okay we know any of this how is he wearing a sign that says all of this yeah you know um th none of that stuff is going to be seen in the movie so we always say if it's important please put it in dialogue or make sure we can see it visually now i will say there is an exception we're going to see um we're going to see one of those exceptions coming up in just a second uh vince gilligan writes stuff all the time in his scene description that you can't possibly see. <clears throat> Pardon me. That's part of his style. Uh, and it, it's extremely effective. So if that's part of your voice, the, you know, it, it just basically, it, it, we'll see when we get to the Vince Gilligan uh, example, but if that's part of your voice, that's great. But if it's done, you know, just without 
in other words, if there, if it's done not to just inform the read, but to actually get information across to the reader about the character that they can't possibly know, then you need to go back and revisit. Yeah. Speaking about uh, seeing, don't write we see, <laughs> because that actually happens a lot. You get a script and every second line starts with, we see this person opening the door, we see a pair of feet, we see a closed window. Yeah, we see everything in scene description. So we see those two words are completely meaningless. When you say, we see him pick up a coffee cup versus he picks up a coffee cup, it's exactly the same thing, just with two extra bloat words that drives people crazy. Just get rid of it. Yeah. Telling, not showing. The famous show, Don't Tell. We already talked about that. Again, uh, don't tell us, well, Joe, you are like this and this and this show us in a scene in what in joe's actions what joe is like yeah uh spelling and format errors obviously i mean this this again falls under the duh category but you know i mean it's real easy to spell check just run a spell check before you before you you know before you make your pdf and, and send it out to anybody it's it's a simple thing but everybody forgets yep uh Describing every character as attractive or tall and every object as large. Yes. <laughs> and, and I would add also that, you know, especially from male writers, there is a tendency to describe female characters as, you know, hotties. Or, you know, every single woman in a, in a screenplay is hot. Um, you know, first of all, that's very demeaning. But I mean, look, every single actor or actress who is going to be in a movie or TV show is going to be attractive. That's just the way it is. So you don't need to write it. And in fact, it's considered uh, offensive and it's considered bad form and just irritating. So just don't do that. Give us specifics as to what we're looking at. You know, um, this character has a, a, a buzz cut um, and, uh, you know, uh, six piercings in each ear uh, and, uh, you know, is wearing a... Um, you know, uh, a, a Led Zeppelin T-shirt, some something like that, just so that we can form a, a, a proper visual image. Tall and attractive are, are just the the go-to adjectives that people do not think about. You know, it, writers are on autopilot sometimes, and they just start typing, and every single thing is large. She, you know, she gets a large cup of coffee. She's got a large dog. She, oh God, it just. Oh, and crazy. hey, hey, let's not forget my favorite. She has large breasts. I mean, seriously, how often do we read this? Oh my God. The one that drives me crazy is uh, is the natural beauty girl next door. I can't tell you how many times <laughs> I've heard that exact phrase. It's just like, oh my God. <laughs> So, yeah. Yes. Is she, is yes. she going to take off her glasses and do the slow mo Clairol hair flip too yes. at some point? Yes. There's like a halo around her. You know, it's always that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. D d don't do that. Basically, a character introduction is who is this person? That's you know what is what is the first impression? What would we think if we saw this person walking down the street? What stands out about them? Think of, you know, creative ways to let us know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and don't do this. The large alarm clock begins to ring and Julia, 24, attractive and tall, starts to press the large snooze button and begins to fall back to sleep. Oh, God. Yeah, don't, don't. Don't do Don't that. do any of it. Yeah. any of it begins to oh god starts to that's another another writer cliche never begin to do an action just do the action please yes present participle or passive voice here's another one that we see all the time that writers just don't think about R wilbur is putting on his shoes now why would you say that when you could use just simply the punchy action verb wilbur puts on his shoes and yet so many scripts we read is with he is doing this she you know they are doing that just go for the action verb get rid of he is doing they are doing please it's bloat we don't need it 
The same goes for as you know line. So if you have an as, as you know line, and it doesn't actually have to say as you know, it can just, you know, be implied, you know, when we first met 10 years ago, you told me this. Remember when you were living in such and such house? In other words, any dialogue that uh, talks about things people wouldn't talk about because they already know them. It's exposition, and characters will not generally say to each other things that they already know. And if you find yourself in a, in a situation where you're writing dialogue, where two characters have to, have to get out some information to the audience because it's crucial information to get out, then please do not put it in character dialogue where characters are telling things to each other that they wouldn't naturally say. If the if the if the natural flow of dialogue with with the characters in that situation is to not tell you what they're talking about at all and leave the audience clueless as to what is going on in that scene, good. Do that. That's what you should do because you will find a way 20 or 30 pages on to more naturally tell us what the context is and then we'll go, oh, okay, that's what they were talking about. But do not feel that you need to explain everything throughout the process. It's exposition. Yes, absolutely. And we've already spoken about starts and begins. Don't start anything. Don't begin anything. Javier makes Javier begins to make a left turn. No. How about Javier just turns left? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, exactly. So here we have a good example of what you uh, need to do if you're going to introduce a whole lot of characters all at once. That's from Aliens. Oh yeah, great movie. So, um, you know, we it can be really difficult if you if you have a, a large cast and you are introducing everybody all in a page or two. Um, it's very hard for readers to keep track of multiple characters when introduced at one time, unless you make them really specific and give them a nice little you know, something about them to remember, a, a hook, a character hook to remember them. For example, aliens, great, great case, right? We meet all the colonial Marines, all wake, waking up from cryo sleep pretty much at the same time. Uh, Apone wakes up from cryo sleep. First thing he does is he, he puts his uh, stogie in his mouth. We, we immediately know, okay, he's a badass. We see uh, Vasquez and she's doing, um, uh, push up i'm uh, sorry chin ups and someone says uh, has anyone ever mistaken you for a man and she goes no uh have they have they mistaken you for a man something like that so we we very quickly get an idea of the personalities of every single one of these characters in a very short period of time and because they're so distinctive and so memorable uh, e you know, each one is a completely separate characterization from the other. And also their names are very dissimilar. That's something to keep in mind as well. Um, you know, the different ethnicities, the, the, the structure of the names is different. Uh, they just look different on the page. It's easy to remember who these people are. And in a very short period of time, we wound up meeting an entire cast of characters very memorably. But that's a, that's a tough thing for emerging writers to do. Yep. And here we're going to put it all together. Three examples of things that went really well. So this is actually the teaser from uh, the original Breaking Bad pilot. Uh, this is when they still had it set in California before they um, decided on Albuquerque. Um, so what he does very well is the visual writing. Again, it's very visual. We know what we see. And his voice comes through loud and clear. Um, if you have not read the Breaking Bad pilot, then consider this your homework. You can find it on the internet in a two second Google search. It's a great read. It's really fun. Um, but just look at how he tells it. I'm just going to read a little bit of this. Exterior cow pasture day, deep blue sky overhead, fat, scuddy clouds. Below them, black and white cows graze the rolling hills. This could be one of those California, it's the cheese commercials. Except those commercials don't normally focus on cow shit. We do. A fat round patty dries olive drab in the sun. Flies buzz, peaceful and quiet, until zoom! Wheels plow right through the shit with a splat. Okay, so we never saw any sort of pasture or cow shit in Breaking Bad because they restaged it to Albuquerque. Um, but still, does it matter? No. What, what, what just happened was we were immediately pulled in 
by this writer's voice. And sure, none of this stuff about the it's the cheese commercials you can see, but it tells us right away, this is a confident screenwriter. And OK, this guy's telling me a story. I'm going to relax and enjoy this ride. Exactly. So here we go to Iron Man. Oh, uh, by the way, one more point yes. I want to bring up about the, the Breaking Bad teaser. All right. <clears throat> And, and it's not on this page because the, the teaser was two and a half pages long or something. But once again, it poses a dramatic question. At the end of that teaser, we're asking, what the hell is going on? We really want to know uh, who these characters are, how they could have gotten into this incredibly bizarre situation, driving around in a motorhome in their tidy whities with gas masks on, with dead people floating around in the back of the, of the RV. And we're like, what the fuck, dude? And that... <laughs> The goodwill that that buys us keeps us going for the next 25 minutes of character intro of meet sad, pathetic Walter White. Yep. Yep. All right. So Iron Man. Let's read this. So Anna and Tanya, why, why don't you do this? Um, so Anna, can you do Jimmy? Tanya, can you do Tony? And I'll do Pratt. Sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, is it true you're 12 for 12 with last year's Maxim Cover Girls? Excellent question. Yes and no. March and I had a schedule conflict, but thankfully the Christmas cover was twins. Anyone else? You with a hand up? Uh, it's a little embarrassing. Join the club. Can I take a picture with you? Are you aware that Native Americans believe photographs steal a little piece of your soul? Not to worry. Mine's long gone. Fire away. My favorite of all the Marvel movies right here, the original Iron Man, kind of lost it in Act 3, but still Acts 1 and 2, just the bomb, absolutely great. But, man, what what great writing. Pardon the typo. Uh, that's, uh, you know, it happens. But um, how much do we learn about Tony Stark right away just from this little bit of dialogue? Not to mention we learn that, that the writers have an incredible sense of wit. But uh, not to worry, mine's long gone. I it mean, tells that's... us everything we need to know about him, yes. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and so because we were talking about the characters uh, during the character setup, what is their dramatic flaw? What is their dramatic need? So uh, this tells us a lot about Tony Stark, what he needs what and who he needs to become. And the whole movie is about this, basically. Um, he's he's lost his soul and he's got to find his way. And that's the reason why he does everything that he does in the movie. Uh, and the whole character arc is basically set up with that with that one line. And by the way, that's page one. Right. And even though it's it's mildly different from what they actually shot, it's still it's the same. Like thematically, it's the same. Yeah. Is it different? I thought it was exactly the same. Okay. No, no, no. I, it's, a, it's a little different. I, I, I worked it. my way through all the Marvel movies recently. I <laughs> 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 prepared myself for Endgame, so I am intimately familiar. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we have one more excerpt here that we're going to read before we get to the Q&A. And um, the reason I wanted to include this bit is because, um, boy, does it, 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 it shows us Marlin's character so um again uh tiny can read marlin and anna can you read nemo sure how many stripes do i have i'm fine answer the stripe question three no see something's wrong with you i have one two three that's all i have oh you're okay how's the lucky fin lucky let's see are you sure you want to go to school this year because there's no problem if you don't you can wait Five or six years. Come on, Dad. It's time for school. Uh, 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 forgot to brush. So, okay. So in less than a page, we have just very, very concisely established Marlin's uh, dramatic flaw, which is? He's completely overprotective of his yep. son. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So what does that point to in terms of what his arc is going to be? Anybody want to chime in? Use the question box. What do you think um, his arc? I mean, I think many of us have seen the movie, but yeah. if you want to chime in, use the question box. What do you think his arc is going to be? Um, and also, let's add that um, what's um, in the in the um, hook scene. We actually saw where his overprotectiveness comes from. 
Right. Yes. Yeah. So this example actually comes from, I think, page four or five of Finding Nemo. So, so yeah, no, it is definitely based on something. For yeah. Sure. And yes, they got it. Yes, he's going to learn to let him go. That's absolutely correct. He's going to learn to step back and let his son grow up and get over his terror of that. And why is this so brilliant? Because it is so universal. I mean, obviously it's fish, but this is something that every parent has to go through and a lesson they have to learn, which makes this movie Four Quadrant. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And I think you should explain Four Quadrant. Sure. Four quad, uh, the four quadrants are um, young, old, male, and female. And when a movie is considered four quadrant, that means it's got something for everyone. It can be a family movie, although not necessarily, but Pixar movies do tend to be four quadrant. Uh, I, the best example of a four quadrant movie ever is The Incredibles, uh, because you've got uh, young people and old people working together. The main storyline is about you know, uh, a, a dad who is uh, having a midlife crisis, uh, but every single character in that movie is well developed. And no matter what stage of life you're in, you can see yourself in those characters, <clears throat> even though it is a, a fantastical, crazy, over the top superhero comedy. Right. All right. We are at the Q and A section, so I know you have found the question box. So fire away with your questions. Uh, basically, what should you do in the first 10 pages? What do you have questions about? Feel free to fire away. Anna, is there anything uh, before the questions come in that uh, as we were going through that we didn't touch on that uh, that sort of uh, speaks to your experience? Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of a lot of first 10 pages, the, the best advice I can I can think of is really try to be original. Um, that seems to be the thing that comes up the most is that you see the same openings over and over and over again. And it's not just, you know, get up, get up, get out of bed, go to work kind of stuff. Although that happens a lot as, as we discuss, it's just, you know, I think because we've all seen so many movies, uh, we tend to open things the same way over and over again. Uh, so if you can find a way to, to be a little subversive or to, start your movie with something that a reader may not have read 14 times in the last two weeks. Um, that's always a plus because as always, the goal is, you know, those first 10 pages are not just to establish that you know how to write, but also to, you want your script to stand out. And, and that's, it's the hardest thing. So, it you is know, the hardest thing, yeah. Yeah, so, so keep at it and try to find a way to make that hook really pop. Exactly. All right, let's get to questions. Uh, first question. I'm working on a one hour TV show, not a full length movie. I'm a little confused about the timing of the inciting incident. Have been told to get in early. Yes. All um, right, so at Anna, you know, your TV is your bag. What do you think about that? Um, I would get to, um, if you're writing sort of a classic one hour, four act thing, I would try to get to your inciting incident by like, you know, page eight, nine, 10 at the latest, because you want your protagonist to be sort of decisively, you know, on his path of what he's going to do by the end of the first act, which is usually 15, between 15 and 20. Yep. So, um, yeah, you basically just, you only have a good seven, eight minutes to sort of deal with the setup of your, of your situation. And by the way, the number one problem we see with pilots is that they are what's called premise pilots, which means they're all set up. Don't do that. No one wants a premise pilot, uh, which is why the number one piece of advice that we give to writers of pilots is write the first two episodes of the show. Now take your first episode and throw it away and use the second episode as your pilot. Because generally what you've spent all of the first episode doing is getting all the pieces into place so that the story can take place from episode two on. You generally don't need any of that stuff. Right. You want you want to introduce the world while the character is doing whatever it is that they're going to do from week to week. Um, the best pilots like I mean, there's a gazillion great pilots out there. Um, I actually watched I went to a screening of the the premiere of Good Omens last night, and that's a fantastic pilot. So when it comes out into watch that. But um, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer is a fantastic pilot. Yes. Um, uh, ER is a fantastic pilot. Sorry, a lot of my examples are from the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> That's when I started writing. So it's like, that's where my brain automatically goes. But Breaking Bad, again, a fantastic pilot. Daredevil. Daredevil's a great pilot. Yes, it yes. is. Yes. Uh, you just, 
yeah, you basically just want to make sure that you are introducing the world as you go along. Like if I were going to write, if I were going to give advice about pilots, just start by thinking about what the character needs to do in this episode to solve the problem and then introduce the world as you're doing that. Exactly. Right. Next question. Any tips on the structure and pacing of the first 10 for an ensemble based drama pilot? Uh, don't worry, I, I do have a lead. <laughs> I have all four of the main characters in their current world established in the four page teaser. In the following six pages of Act One, should I focus primarily on the lead character story? Ooh, wow. Well, it sounds like this writer is uh, in pretty good shape. Anna, what do you think about that? Um, yes, I, if I, I think I'm understanding. Could you read the beginning part of the question again? What is it? Sure. Uh, the beginning part is any tips on the structure and pacing of the first 10 for an ensemble based uh, drama uh, pilot? Yeah, I mean, any ensemble is going to have a leader unless you're writing Game of Thrones, which please don't write Game of, Th Game of Thrones. I mean, one of the things that we see a lot of is uh, people trying to emulate this path of having 20 main characters and 13 story threads. And it's just, it's it's very hard to accomplish. And it's um, it's tough to do in a spec pilot just because, you know, people are not gonna be familiar with your work. If you wanna expand your world after the pilot, great, but but try to keep it contained. Um, I, I would stick with the, the, I would suggest using your lead character as kind of like as the anchor thread and maybe making the other ensemble characters slightly secondary. Um, if you're even if you're aiming for a true ensemble, just because having one person whose job it is to carry the structure through the story is going to give it a lot more momentum rather than feeling you, what you want to avoid is this jerky back and forth like the story is not building because we're constantly cutting between all these different the, all these different character threads. Does that help? <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, very, very, very true. All right, we are kind of, I've just noticed, completely running out of time because we just talk way too much. But as in we always case, do. As we always do. But in case you have any questions in between webinars or anything, you can always email us. We're always happy to answer your questions. So <laughs> feel free to email us at info at coverageinc.com. Yeah, no one sends us recipes, but that would be great. Recipes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Anna would like some recipes if you have them. Yes, please. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.